Good morning, High Point. Hey, so glad that you are here. If this is your first time here at High Point, my name is Caleb. I'm the lead pastor here. And we are seriously honored that you would spend your Sunday morning here with us. High Point family, can you show all of our new friends some love this morning? Come on, let's put our hands together and just, then also online, we're so grateful that you're here with us today. And uh, just excited, we are moving into week three of our collection of messages entitled Ready. And we want to be ready for what God has for us. I believe that this is gonna be a year of freedom for our church family, for us individually, but we gotta be ready. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever found yourself in awkward situations? My wife tells me I'm the king of awkward. I found myself in some awkward situations in life, like asking a lady if she's pregnant when she's really not pregnant. Oh, I only did that once. When are you due? Oh, you're not. You know, listen, that's awkward. Don't do that. I've been in awkward situations on a date, at a baseball game, get put on the kiss cam, she shakes her head no. Not my wife. This is, pre, this, is, this is before more. Come on, awkward. And the whole stadium's cheering. And I'm turning on the inside. Just, nope. Uncomfortable. What do you do when you get uncomfortable? You squirm. You, you just stumble over your words. You, you start to sweat. You, you get very uncomfortable. Can, can I tell you in your spiritual walk, and your spiritual journey, this fight that we're in, the enemy doesn't desire just to make you uncomfortable. His ultimate goal is to take you out. Scripture tells us that the enemy has come to steal, kill, and what? Destroy. And to me, to me that sounds like a death threat. To me that sounds like an attempt to take us out. And we are in this spiritual battle that we've got to understand that the enemy desires to destroy, but at the same time, in that same reminder that the enemy is out to steal, kill, and destroy, Scripture tells us that Jesus has come so that we may have life, so that we can have a life. And in the Scripture that we're looking at during the series, we're looking at Ephesians chapter 6, and this is a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. It was a city. And he tells them, starting in chapter 6, he, he tells them this. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. If you need a Bible, our team will give you one for free, no strings attached. If you have a Bible, I would encourage you to bring it to church and write in it and take notes. Because this is, this is more than just a Sunday morning experience. Our faith is an everyday thing. And so I want you to man, take God's word with you and let it speak to you. But here's what it says in Ephesians chapter 6. It says, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on all, everybody say all, all of God's armor so that you may be able to stand firm against all the strat strategies of the, of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against Power, the mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you may be able to resist the enemy and the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground by putting on the belt of truth. See, Paul understood. Paul could grasp that we're in a spiritual battle. And that no one is exempt. When you look at Paul's ministry, as he moved and went into Ephesus, which is present day Turkey, he was run out of the synagogue by unbelieving Jewish leaders in Acts chapter 18. He faced opposition. A few verses later, we see that he was mocked. He was mocked by apostate Jewish uh, exorcist. And then he, and then he was threatened by the, silversmith, the silversmiths who were making idols. He was threatened by those people because of his ministry. It was costing them money because people were coming to faith and the church was flourishing in the midst of this really uh, uh, anti-God culture and it was costing them money. And so they were, they were angry with Paul and, and they, they were coming after him. Their whole business was suffering because of Paul's ministry. You see that he faced opposition when you look at Jesus. 
at the very onset of his ministry, he faced temptation. He didn't eat for for many days, and, 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 and at the end of his time on earth, before he died on the cross, we see that the fight, the opposition was so real and so heavy that as he prayed, he, bl- he, he sweat drops of blood. You gotta understand that when we look at these two examples of spiritual obedience, Paul being that he answered the call of God to go to Ephesus, and then also Jesus to come down to this earth, as they grew in obedience, it didn't get easier along the way. What, what does that mean? That means that as we grow in obedience to Christ and as we say yes to Jesus and as we do the right things, it doesn't mean it will get easier. It just means that he can help us be ready for it. God does not promise us ease, but he does offer us armor. He offer us, he's offering us armor. And when we look at this, this is why Paul is writing uh, about spiritual armor. He talks about four different defensive tools and then one offensive tool. And as we look at this, these aren't things that we just pick up and, and, and put them on when we need them. It's something that we wear permanently because sometimes if you try to just uh, develop these tools or these pieces of armor when you need it, it might be a little bit late. Does anybody in their, their family or their household or maybe their roommates have anybody that's always late? That's why you're at the 1030 service, huh? <laughs> you meant to come to the nine, but you just didn't quite make it. So you left the house late, you swang through the bucks, and now you're in church. I don't know, maybe it's this morning you're sitting in your kitchen like Sonic the Hedgehog. Alexa, make an announcement. What's your announcement? We're leaving. We're late. Let's go. I'm still getting ready. Anybody? And I got to tell you, it's not just the ladies. Oh, Pastor Robbie's the slowest of all. (laughs) Come on. He's got to figure out which outfit he's going to wear. Oh, don't think I'm blasting the ladies today. You know, in our spiritual journey... We don't just get ready and prepare ourselves for a battle because you don't know what kind of battles you're walking into today. You stay ready, you stay armored up, and these things aren't heavy and hard to carry, they're just essential for victory. And so when we look at this, this is exactly what Paul was telling, and, and the Greek word that he used to, 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 that is translated to put on has the connotation that it's something that stays on something that stays on, that, that, that it doesn't just something that we take off at the end of the day and put on. It's not something that we just occasionally acknowledge. It's a tool, it's an asset that we use to put on. And the first part, the first piece of defensive armor that we have is the belt of truth. Stand therefore, in verse 14, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. As Paul is writing this letter around 60 AD, he's writing from, A prison cell, likely seeing the Roman soldiers come and go dressed in their armor. A Roman soldier would wear a a tunic, a a piece of cloth or or a, a piece that would go over their head and their arms would go through. But it was a loose piece of garment and they would actually need a belt to tighten up this loose piece of of cloth and in fact before they would go into battle while they were getting dressed they would take the the belt and they would take the tunic pull it through their legs and cinch it up all tight because much of their combat much of the fight was hand-to-hand combat and 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 up close combat and something that was all over the place loose flying all over the place not only could be a hindrance it could be a danger for their own personal uh, safety and so they they used the belt to hold everything together which would then later also hold up the the, the body armor, the, the breastplate. See, the belt of truth is, is significant. And we believe, yes, that, that if, we knew, if we know truth, the truth will set us free. Yes, absolutely. And knowing the content of God's word is, is essential for us if we're gonna battle successfully against the, the schemes of the enemy. But, and even in Ephesians, we see in Ephesians chapter 4, 14, it tells us that we are subject to being carried around about, uh, by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness and deceitful scheming, if we do not know the truth of God's word. And we're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks, but more specifically than just knowing the truth of God's word, the belt of truth 
is talking about something different. It's talking about individual integrity and living with a clear conscience. Individual integrity and living with a clear conscience. Now, I know some of you are thinking, are you gonna get up all of my business today? And the answer is yes. And some of you are thinking, why are you gonna make it personal? And I'm not, because here's the reality, is that I don't have to make it personal because the gospel is personal. The, the gospel set us personally free, individually free from our sins, from our pitfalls. So we all love the fact that there's forgiveness, grace, and mercy. Does anybody appreciate that? But very few of us like the accountability part that actually requires something of you and I. Why? Because we want the easy way out, don't we? No? Come on, when you're putting furniture together, aren't you always looking for the easiest way to put it together? The fastest way, especially if it's Ikea. We pray for those people. We're all, we always want the easiest fix. But can I tell you that when you become a Christian, when you follow God, yes, you receive grace and mercy and freedom and restoration, but our lives must reflect the level of grace that we have received. And it calls us to a higher standard, to a higher level of living. Not, oh no, not so we can be better than other people. That is not the objective. The objective is a living a life that is pleasing to God. Oh, don't judge me, only God can judge me. That, you ever heard that before? The answer is you're correct, only God can judge you. But I, when I am judged, I wanna be pleasing to God. So what does that require? That requires us to live differently. And so here's two thoughts this morning. First, that living with a clean conscience means that you don't need to worry about cleaning up your latest mess. And mess, I mean, sometimes in life, I'm not just talking about mess on the floor. I'm talking about relational mess. I'm talking about financial mess. I'm talking about mess at work. Come on, when you live with a clear conscience, it means that you don't have to worry about cleaning up your latest mess. We strive to teach our boys uh, to be responsible. We actually have a pretty clean house. We try, come on, I don't know if anybody, any parents can identify with this, but it is a challenge teaching five and seven-year-old little boys to keep their house clean. Let me tell you a little bit about this. A couple of months ago, go down to the basement and there's nothing on the floor because they had cleaned up. But I smell something and it's beyond the must of little boys that had played outside. Y'all know that smell. Oh, you don't. If you want to just, come on when they come, come on, it's beyond that. I smell something. So I'm looking around and I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm like spraying the Febreze on the couch and spraying them a little bit because they need a little bit of refresh spraying them. And, I, and, and, I, and I'm leaning over to pick something, I'm vacuuming the ground, trying to make sure everything's clean. I lean over and I look between the, the back wall and where the couch is. And I said, I thought y'all cleaned up. And I look in there and there is an extensive amount of trash, banana peels, <laughs> apple cores, and little snacks wraps all over the place. That was the smell. And I'm not talking about like a day old banana peel. I'm talking about week old banana peel. Oh, hell yeah, some of you are all judging me now. Come on, like I, I, I just telling you in the basement, I was like, man, what is that smell? And those boys, I tell you what, it was nasty. And I getting all that stuff up and, and cleaning it all out and, and, and all, all the stuff that they had stuffed away that nobody else knew about. And, and they were like, I said, who's this? I don't know. <laughs> How am I supposed to know, Dad? It's not mine. Micah, <laughs> appalled. How am I supposed, you know, in our lives, a lot of us are 
good at cleaning, at surface level cleaning things up, but the things that we don't really want to do, see all that, they, they just, they stuffed everything behind the couch and, and it was the stuff they didn't want to deal with. And to go upstairs to actually throw it away in the trash. And a lot of times in our lives, we're good at surface level cleaning, but we stuff all the, the stuff that we don't want to do or don't want to address behind the couch of our life. And over time, it starts to, to, to grow things that weren't in, initially there. And it starts to smell a little bit more. And we wonder, why is this happening? And, and, and I gotta tell you, you know, in our lives, it's not every case, but in some cases, the relational mess or the strife or the challenge that we face in our organizations and our teams and our, wherever it is, maybe, maybe it's, it, not all cases, but a lot of times it starts with something that was maybe not a full lie, but a half truth. And it grows legs over time. And it starts to develop into being something. And maybe in your relationship with your spouse, it started with like, oh, I, like a, I'm on my way home, but you're not really on your way home. You made a pit stop. Or quite possibly it's something small, like, you know what, this is my resume. And you padded it. Oh, come on, Caleb, you're gonna go there? Yeah, I am. Well, I just, uh, it's, in our culture, what do they call them? They call them white lies. They're, they're like very small. But the truth with, with, with white lies is that they grow and, and they start out with no harm. And, and some, of you, some of you gotta be reminded today that no matter how big or how small something is, Paul tells us that truth holds it all together. Truth holds it all together. And in our lives, no matter whether it's small or big, is it, does it, is it harmless or is it hurtful? Sometimes people don't tell the truth because it might hurt someone's feelings. Do I look good in this? Come on, <laughs> tell the truth. Anybody ever been putting that predicament before? Listen, that's probably not one to touch. <laughs> See, lying is defined as making an untrue statement with the intent to deceive. And while a small white lie is an untrue statement, it's usually considered unimportant because there's no serious consequence or no major, no major re repercussions. Even sometimes a white lie is deceptive, maybe polite, just to be polite, or could be tactful to, to hold peace in a relationship, or it could be helpful to benefit in business. Or it could be minor to make, someone, make yourself look better than you really are. You know, some, some, sometimes white lies are even funny. Like, you know any people that fish? You know where I'm going with this? How big was the fish? Instead of being this big, which is not a bad fish, it was this big. Which is funny, right? And I'm not really even... That's not my objective just to come after fishermen, but it just shows you the picture. Sometimes it's just not needed. You know, how, you know how interesting our culture is today? That people want to present themselves bigger and better and smarter and more successful than they even truly are most of the time? Why? Because we all want to be valuable. And so there's even this phenomena in our culture today when you look at like Twitter or even um, Instagram TikToks where you can buy followers. How ridiculous is that? Some of you don't know what those things are. It's okay, I'm talking to a younger demographic right now. Twitter, who, come on. I, I just gotta tell you, like, it's just, uh, it's just an eye-opening thing that why would we wanna present a narrative that isn't true? Why? Because we wanna be valuable, which is okay. The desire is good, but the action itself is deceitful. It's a, it's a wide stretch from where I'm talking about, from very small things to very big things. But you've got to understand that we live in a society that has conditioned us to believe that any size, whether as long as it didn't hurt anybody or it doesn't have major repercussions, then it's really okay. It's acceptable. But it, it is true that sin, some sins bring about worse consequences. How many of you have taught people in your life or have a conversation that every decision that we make in life has both good and bad consequences? Do you agree? 
So it's not fair to say that every, every untruthful statement in our life is gonna bring about the same consequences as, say, murder. Whoa, that got real and heavy. Yeah, what we're talking about is real things. But let, let me just point you back to scripture in Romans 6, 23, in the eyes of God, all sin is dishonoring to him. All sin. Well, I, I'm not as bad as a murderer. No, you, you, probably not, but can I tell you, in the eyes of God, we've all fallen short. Every last one of us. And a lot of people in our society don't like that because we like to compare ourselves to other people. Oh, yeah, I'm not as bad. You ever heard that? Oof, oof. <laughs> That's the stench. I'm okay, I live in Southeast Aurora. I mean, I live right here too, so I'm not all up in your business, but the reality is we're no better than anybody else. The only thing that we have that other people need is the hope of Jesus in their life. And we've gotta realize and understand that none of us, whether it's big or small, tactful or non-tactful, we all need the grace of Jesus. And when we, tell, when we don't tell the truth, you know that the, the thing that, that's, hard for, for, for people that are in a narrative that is not true, it's hard for them to realize that most people can tell that what they're saying is not true anyways. I had a boss who we used to call hound doggy. And uh, why? Because when someone would make a half-truth statement or say something that's not all truth, he would start to sniff it out. <laughs> so he would start to ask provoking questions and I would even sometimes in my head howl like a dog. Oh! <laughs> and I would, you know, the person that I sat to in our, in, in our staff meetings, I was like, yo, they're on the trail. They should just tell the truth. You ever, you ever sent, had someone that just that really strong discernment before to know? And, and it's very interesting because uh, he would find out the truth. And, and can I tell you that most of the time when you t don't tell the truth, people can, can tell. Like when, when your kids are lying to you, you can tell, you, they know, you know, and they know, and this doesn't change as, as an adult. You, you've gotta understand that Jesus even told his disciples in Luke chapter 12 that anything that is said in secret will eventually be exposed in the light. And then anything that, that's whispered behind closed doors will, will eventually be revealed. So why would, we, why would we create a narrative that is deceptive when the creator of our narrative already knows the truth? Why? Because we create a story or a timeline or a situation to cover up something that was not true and it just grows and grows and grows and it could have been avoided. But, but living with a clear conscience enables you to... Man, to to just know, man, I'm living right before God. And I'm not doing it to be better. We're not better than people, anybody else. We're living our lives so that we can please God. That's our ultimate goal. But it, why create a path of deception when you can live a life of truth? Because living with intentional or individual integrity enables you to replace your fear of being found out with confidence that you've done what is right. Let me say this again, living with individual integrity enables you to replace your fear of being found out with confidence that you've done what is right. We live in a, in a world today where people are constantly looking over their shoulder because they're fearful of being found out. I got a confession for you, want a true statement? From myself, I'm still afraid of the dark. Y'all can laugh, it's fine. I'm not joking though, because if you were to ever look at the cameras of here at the church, late at night, when all the lights are out, you wouldn't see me walking through this building. You see me running through this building. I'm locking every door. Oh, it's completely true. I, I get, you ever been in a big building late at night by yourself? It's dark, scary, Sc scary. I heard a noise. The ceiling cracked. It just drive me nuts. I'm, I'm running around crazy. I, you know why I don't watch crazy, scary movies? Because I create bigger stories of my head than they created in the movie. 
I don't like it. I create a big long thing in my head that that crazy scary person, which I have, I, I, you promise, ask Morgan, I don't watch scary stuff. I even get scared at sitcoms. <laughs> Why? Because I create this, narr- I'm like running, flipping on every light in the house. Come on, I just don't like it. Then I'm always looking over my shoulder like there's this thing out to get me. In reality, there's no one here. There's no one here, and guess what? No one's here trying to get me either. But I've created a narrative in my mind that isn't true. And when we live with a clear conscience, you can, you can have a confidence and you don't have to look over your shoulder like someone is out to get you in your life. Or that you're gonna get found out for whatever. And, and there are so many people that are looking over their shoulders because of the narrative that's been created. Like someone's out to get you, like someone said something about you. You, Did you hear the tone that they used when they said my name? No, I didn't. I, I I really didn't. Two truths about looking over your shoulder or thinking that someone's out to get you. Truth number one is they're probably not thinking about you anyways. Y'all know that song, you're so vain. You think the song is about you, don't you? Ooh. I just identified and connected with the 50 plus crowd. Come on, I just, (laughs) woo. You're not. You know, a lot of times when we think that someone is out to get us or we're gonna get found out, the person's probably not thinking about you anyways. It's probably not a thought in their mind. But the truth is, is that you're fearful of being found out because you led a life that wasn't truthful. So the enemy who inflicts fear and confusion is confusing your mind to think that someone wants to get you. And the the, the real truth is that God wants to set you free from that fear. Truth number two about looking over your shoulder is that when you've done the right thing, you don't have anything to worry about. When, When you've done the right thing, you're not, oh no, oh no. You know, it's like getting called in. Did you ever get called into your boss's office before? Only me? <laughs> and you're like, what did I do? What did I do? What did I do? Nobody ever been there? I don't know about you, but like, it was like, what did I do? But when you live with personal and individual integrity, you can have a clear conscience to know that you've done the right thing and that you don't have anything to be afraid of. So no matter whether you're going into your boss's office or you're sitting down at your dinner table, you can have a clear heart and a clear mind before God because you've know, you know what you've done. You've, do, you've done the right thing. And there's just so much freedom to that, isn't there? There's just so much freedom to to knowing that I'm living an upright life before God. And the truth in my life is holding it all together. I don't got to clean up a mess. I think that a lot of times we, we, we got to, we feel like, oh man, I got to, I got to, I'm going to get found out. See, the enemy is the one who is out to steal, kill, and destroy. And remember what I said, Jesus has come that we would have life. And there was no fear in Jesus because we know that he gives us restoration and wholeness. But we live in a culture plagued with fear of being found out. And some of you are like, you're not running from a person. You feel like, you're, you're, like God's going to find you out. That like God is after, out to get you. And he is out to get you, but not in the way that you think he is. He's not out to condemn you or to shame you or to hurt you. He's out to give you a fresh start, a new beginning and his grace. So instead of running from grace, turn to grace. See, what you've got to understand is that sometimes when, we, when, we, when we're looking over our shoulders, we forget about the very promise of God that he is He's there to redeem us. Now, it doesn't excuse consequences that we've made, decisions that every, every decision and everything that we do in life has consequences. But what it does when we turn to the grace is that he redeems us and, and makes us right with him. And there are situations in our life that we've got to understand sometimes that we have to tell the truth even when it may cost you something. This is something we talk a lot about with our kids is to tell the truth even when it may cost you something. 
even when it may cost you something. You know, sometimes telling the truth is not easy. In fact, it can be downright unpleasant. But we are called to be truth tellers. Abraham Lincoln, after the, after the last service, someone told me this quote. Abraham Lincoln used to say, I don't only have to remember half as much as I used to remember because I only, I only, there, there's only one truth. It's like we are called to be truth tellers, and, and it makes it just so much freedom in that. But when we don't, we have to understand that it may cost us something. And being truthful is precious to God. Proverbs chapter 12 tells us this. It, de- it demonstrates an honor and a reverence for God. Furthermore, it tells, it tells us that truth is not a suggestion, it's a command. In Psalms 15 too, it tells us that those who lead blameless lives and do what is right, speaking the truth from sincere hearts, they will find favor with God. Think about this. A lot of times in our life, we ask God, will you bless me? Will you bless my family? Will you bless my business? Will you bless this? Will you bless that? But one of the ways to find blessing is to lead a blameless life, to do what is right in speaking the truth from sincere hearts. Think about it. That's where we find blessing and favor. It comes from our obedience. And being truthful, listen, flies in the face of our enemy, our true enemy, the devil, Satan. Because he is a father of lies. And so as the team is coming, I want you to process this. I want you to think about this, that as we are truth tellers, being truth, being truthful honors the Lord, who is the God of truth. And the belt of truth is a crucial piece of our defensive armor. Why is that not offensive? Because when we're standing firm, everything's holding together. When we're standing our ground, it's holding everything together. I like to bake. I'm not very good at it. Any bakers? Three of us, okay. (laughs) I like to bake, and one night we had some friends over and I wanted to make a cake on the fly. Yeah, that was a bad idea. (laughs) And not that good. Uh, I watched the YouTube videos, so I was overconfident, and I made a cake from scratch And it looked all good until the middle sunk in and crumbled all over the place. The whole thing was a hot mess. Uh, It's because I tried to exchange one, one ingredient for another that I didn't have and it all fell apart. And then it became hard as a hockey puck, you know, like it was just, it was really bad. You know, there's, there are some ingredients in our lives that can't be replaced and telling the truth is one of those. And it's hard sometimes. And we don't do it to be better than people. We do it so that we can be pleasing to God. And our lives and our motives and our outlook, how we approach situations changes with the belt of truth. So I wanna ask that you would stand to your feet uh, this morning and just take a moment to reflect. I hope you don't leave like that this morning. (laughs) There's a lot of grace for for all of us. Here's here's what I want you to, to, to just process. Maybe you wanna close your eyes just for a moment right where you're at. I wanna ask you a very vulnerable question. Is there an area of your life that you know, whether it be really, really small or really big, that you need to start telling the truth with? Or there, is, there a, is there a pattern in your communication that needs to be altered? So that, so that you can be truthful. I think a lot of times we leave situations feeling bad, but I wanna challenge you to make a decision right now before that moment or that decision to just be truthful. Is there an, is, is there an area of your life that you need to surrender to God? 
and, and give back to him and to ask for help. Because whatever shoved in between the couch and the wall will eventually present itself in one way or the other. The question is, will you address it or will you allow someone else? Come on, I just, I wanna ask you vulnerably today, will you surrender that to the Lord? If that's you this morning, no one looking around, this is just a moment between you and the Lord. How many of you say, you know what, that, I have an area, I don't care who you are or what you do or how you got here this morning, but I wonder if there's an area of your life that you need, I mean, you need God's strength in or a reset in, in truth telling, you need God's support and help in that. Would you raise your hand this morning? Say, no, that's me, I, I, I need that. Yeah, room, there's people raising their hands all over this room, you're not alone. The, the enemy is the deceiver, the liar to say that you're the only one. That is just simply, it's simply not true. And I wanna pray for you this morning that God would give you strength that God would, would give you confidence where you don't have to look over your shoulder, but he would restore and redeem. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you are a God of peace. And I pray that the peace of God, which surpasses our understanding, would flood into the hearts and minds of every individual that just said, you know, I need help. I need God's strength and, I, and to hold it all together. God, I just pray, Lord, that you would give us your heart, that you would give us your, your mind. Lord, I just pray that when we're in moments of opportunity, Lord, I just pray that the truth would flow through our hearts and our minds. God, personal integrity, God, let it be our protection, God. Let it be the very thing that helps us and strengthens us along the way. And Lord, we just declare that we will be truth tellers, that we'll be declarers of truth, even when it's hard sometimes, even though sometimes it may cost us a business deal or it may cost us an opportunity or might qua might, might might ruffle feathers, but we're gonna ultimately live honorable lives before you, God. And I just pray for protection and confidence to know that doing the right thing and living with personal integrity and telling the truth is honorable and pleasing to you. And Lord, we just thank you for fresh starts and new beginnings. As your heads are still bowed and eyes are closed, this morning I have a, a big question are you right with God today? The first question was really applying to anybody, but there may be a person or a group today to say, you know what? I have come into this place knowing that I am not right with God, that I have things that are not in order with God today, or you know that you have sin in your life. Scripture tells us that we have all fallen short. I have this team on the stage. Every last one of us, we've fallen short of God's standards, but the gift of God is salvation. What is salvation? Is declaring and confessing our need for God and acknowledging that Jesus is the one who saves and redeems. See, Jesus came down to this earth, lived a sinless life, but died a sinner's death, got put into a grave, and three days later, just like he promised, he rose from the dead. If you believe that and confess that with your mouth that he is Lord, you will be saved. That is the gospel. That's the good news. And if you need to get things in order with God today, no matter how you got here, how old or how young you are, or no matter what you know, sometimes some, sometimes we find ourselves in these situations. You didn't hear anything I said this whole time. You were in your head about other things. But in this moment, you're hearing that Jesus loves you, that he's for you, that he's not against you, that he's come to give you a fresh start. And if you hear my heart today and the word of God declaring over your life, this is your moment, this is your time to start fresh with Jesus. And if you want that for your life, if you want a fresh start with him, you wanna commit your life to him, this does not mean everything gets easier. It just makes you right with God. And if you want that for your life this morning, when I count to three, I want you to raise your hand. All that's gonna happen is we're gonna pray together. Then we're gonna celebrate and sing part of a song. We'll go home. I'm not here to embarrass you, but I, I will challenge you to make a declaration, a, a confession, just by saying, you know, that's me. I need that in my life. Would you raise your hand? One, two, three. Say, you know what, that's me. I need a fresh start with God. God today. I need him in my life. Anybody else say, you know what? I need him in my life today. Come on, anybody else say, you know what? I need a fresh start with him. I need a fresh start with him. Come on, several other people are raising. Anybody, I need a fresh start with him today. And everybody who raised their hand this morning, would you repeat this prayer after me as well, as well as everybody who loves the Lord? Would you repeat this prayer, sir? Dear Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe 
that you are the Son of God and I commit my life to you. I will follow you every day of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's put our hands together this morning for those who made that decision. It's the best decision that you could ever make. Come on, before we leave today, can we just take a moment and just declare, come on, that he, He's all that we want and all that we need and that, that He is worthy of our praise. Come on, let's lift our voices together and declare this truth before we go. that decision to follow Jesus today. Some of our team will be over here to my right hand side, your left hand side. Before you leave, may come say hi. We promise we're not gonna mess up your lunch plans and keep you very long, but we wanna, man, we'd love to learn your name and uh, help you in your faith journey because this is not the finish line, it's just a start. And so we wanna help you along the way. Everybody else, thank you for coming today. I pray that the blessing and the hand of God would guide you and protect you every single day of your life your family, your business, your kids, every aspect. And I can't wait to see you next week. The best is still yet to come. We'll see you.